thousands of miles from the nearest anything. But these rocks, scattered across all seven seas, are among the remotest places on Earth. But life here isn't lonely. A penguin metropolis with a population rivaling Washington, D.C. Surrounded by oceans teeming with life. Cruel and savage outposts where harmless birds have become blood-drinking vampires. Beaches where journeys that encircle the globe reach their end. A new life begins countless times over. These islands share one thing in common. They are all British overseas territories. Their secret lives have remained hidden. Join us on an epic journey to reveal these islands' wild secrets. On this journey, we'll travel the length of the South Atlantic. From the frozen wastelands of Antarctica to the equator, visiting islands unknown to most of the world. Our trip begins here on Ascension, an island that erupted from the sea. Described as hell with the fires put out, it's a young island, at least in geological terms. It only broke the surface of the waves about a million years ago. Halfway between Africa and South America, it sits just a few degrees south of the equator. Searing heat scorches the desolate landscape. With nothing but open ocean for thousands of miles, massive, powerful waves smash into Ascension's lava shores, carving spectacular shapes and dramatic blowholes. At just 34 square miles, Ascension is a dot in the ocean, lost in the vastness of the Atlantic. In 1815, the British garrisoned the island. For them, this unpromising speck of land had one thing in its favor its strategic location, right in the middle of the Atlantic. It's still an important base today. On ascension, even the beaches look like they've witnessed a military attack. And in a way, they have. Just offshore, the invaders wait for night to fall before they launch their assault. Green turtles, weighing at least 350 pounds, these heavily armored giants take the shore like a tank battalion. These females have been feeding on beds of turtle grass off the coast of Brazil and have just crossed more than 1,200 miles of ocean to find this speck of land. First, all four flippers are used to dig a crater. Her eggs need just the right moisture content in the sand, so she uses her sensitive hind flippers to test it before she carries on digging. Eventually, she's satisfied and fills the hole with her clutch of eggs. Ascension's beaches were once one of the biggest green turtle nesting colonies in the Atlantic. But they were the perfect food to feed hungry sailors on passing ships. And over the centuries, their numbers fell.
This trade has long since ended, and the turtles are now strictly protected. And their numbers are finally rising again. For the turtles, daybreak is a warning. The broiling equatorial sun will soon turn the exposed beach into an oven. They must get back to the water as quickly as possible or risk being cooked alive in their own shell. At last, these huge animals make it back to their true element. The highlands of Ascension are home to another epic voyager, the land crab. Each year, they leave their burrows and, like the turtles, head for the beaches. It's just as dangerous. They must cross the searing lava fields, death traps for any crabs caught in the open during the day, grilled and cooked alive. They must descend by night to reach the spawning beaches. These land crabs can't swim, but nature dictates they must release their eggs into the sea. As waves break over them, they shake their eggs loose, but they have to be careful. If they're swept out to sea, they'll drown. Those who survive must now make the treacherous journey back up to their mountain home. Human intervention has made the trip much more dangerous. The arrival of people has had devastating effects on Ascension's wildlife. The remote island was easily colonized by ocean-spanning seabirds. Ascension was a safe, predator-free home to millions of them. But now, vast areas of the island are ghost colonies, where only the white droppings of seabirds remain. And these are the culprits. Rats escaped from the ships that called here. And they quickly ate their way through one of the world's most spectacular seabird colonies. But there's one place where it's possible to get a glimpse of what Ascension might once have looked like. It's not far away, just under 300 yards offshore and tiny. Bosenbird Island. The voracious predators never made it across to this outcrop. Like a fortress built against invaders, here Ascension seabirds survive. The air is alive with birds. Fairy terns nest on steep cliffs.
tailed tropic bird. Sailors nicknamed them bosun birds because their calls sound like a bosun's whistle. And this island is now named after them. The rough slopes around the edge of the island are the territory of the frigate birds. The males have inflatable red throat pouches which they use to display to females. These birds are special. They are Ascension Island frigates. Found nowhere else on Earth. And when the seabirds were wiped out on the main island, this tiny offshore fortress became the Ascension frigate's only home. But the population is barely hanging on. With nowhere else to go, they have just one hope, a conservation project. In 2002, an intensive campaign began to remove the worst predator, cats, from the main island. Within four years, Ascension was declared cat-free. And now the seabirds are beginning to reclaim their former territory. Masked boobies were among the first to spread from crowded Bosun Bird Island to a new spacious home. Noddy terns have also returned to the main island, along with tropic birds. Brown boobies joined the incomers. Only the threatened Ascension frigate was slow to take the plunge. Then in 2012, two pairs attempted to nest, and one pair succeeded in rearing a chick. The first Ascension frigate born on the main island in over 150 years. But it will still be a long time before Ascension is again home to the millions of birds seen by the first people to arrive. Like the seabirds, Ascension's turtles were almost eaten to extinction. But under strict protection, their numbers have recovered. And after two months under the warm sand, the hatchlings are ready to make their way to the sea. It may be years before these hatchlings return here to lay their own eggs. But they'll still be able to remember where this tiny island is, in the vastness of the ocean. Eight hundred miles southeast of Ascension is another volcanic speck of land, St. Helena. The only way to get here is by ship, but not just any ship. One of the last working Royal Mail postal ships, the RMS St. Helena. The capital, Jamestown, is built in a steep-sided valley. Founded in 1659 by the East India Company, its long history is visible around every corner. A British city in the middle of the Atlantic. St. Helena is 13 million years older than Ascension. Since its birth, animals and plants have washed up on its shores. Cut off from the rest of the world, these castaways had time to evolve on their own into creatures that existed nowhere else on Earth. 
when the first explorers landed, they found an island covered in green vegetation. St. Helena still looks green, but today most of these species have been introduced. Kaffir figs from South Africa. And New Zealand flax, which now covers huge areas of the island. Much of the native vegetation has been destroyed by farm animals brought in by settlers. Many of St. Helena's unique species are now extinct or confined to a few inaccessible slopes, like this scrubwood tree. Its unique forests once sheltered all kinds of strange animals. The spiky yellow woodlouse is now down to only a hundred or so individuals. And many birds have gone. It once had its own species of cuckoo, a hoopoe, a rail, and several kinds of petrels. Conservationists on the island now collect the seeds of the last remaining native plants to ensure the survival of these original species. The plan is to rebuild the lost forests so that the rare and fragile creatures that depend on them will flourish again. But rebuilding is not an easy task and will take decades. Islands are critical to understanding how life on our planet evolves. Cut off by endless oceans, they're filled with strange creatures whose way of life is at risk from outside invasion. Now our journey takes us to yet another isolated ecosystem and a new set of surprising creatures. To the south lies the world's most remote inhabited island. Nearly 1,500 miles from the nearest continent, Tristan de Cunha. All the islands we visited so far were created by erupting volcanoes long ago. But here on Tristan, the huge volcano is still active. It last erupted in 1961. The rich volcanic soil is extremely fertile. All the land is communally owned and the islanders live by fishing and farming. They have to be virtually self-sufficient, as the supply ships only make the long, lonely journey a few times a year. And they keep livestock, sheep and cows, just as the first settlers did when they arrived in the early 19th century. Tristan's only town Edinburgh of the Seven Seas has fewer than 300 inhabitants. The locals call it the settlement. It may be small, but it has everything you might need. Even a supermarket. People have had less impact here than on Ascension or St. Helena, but their presence has been felt. Especially by these penguins. Almost 90% of the world's population of northern rockhopper penguins nest on these islands. Their numbers are in decline. Perhaps pollution and overfishing in their ocean feeding grounds are taking its toll. And they are part of the diet of another creature. Subantarctic fur seals. They might look cute, 
They are quite capable of catching and killing rock hoppers at sea. Fur seals themselves almost became extinct in the 19th century, hunted for their pelts. Now, under protection, their numbers are rising dramatically. Only a week old, the pups are left amongst the boulders for days at a time, while their mothers are away fishing. This pup's mother's returning. The pup calls out so she knows where it is. Fur seal milk is highly nutritious. And after a day or so of suckling, the pup will have put on enough weight to survive a few more days of starvation. Fur seal colonies are noisy places, yet they don't seem to have a problem relaxing. Penguins and fur seals alike rely on the rich waters that surround these islands. Underwater, they're in their element. They fly through the water, using their front flippers as wings, weaving in and out of the forests of giant kelp. They seem to perform these underwater ballets just for the fun of it. Back on land, these islands have become home to some surprising birds. Tiny finches made it here all the way from South America and have evolved into different species, each with a different size bill to forage on different size seeds. While the finches still feed on seeds like their South American ancestors, island life has completely transformed the Tristan thrush. and it's developed a rather gruesome diet. Penguins. It feeds by pecking at open wounds, picking at flesh and drinking blood. It might seem freakishly disturbing, but natural selection is blind to such sensibilities. There was an opportunity here, and the Tristan thrush simply exploited it. Island evolution has twisted a songbird into a carnivore. But this odd parasitic relationship doesn't seem to threaten Tristan's penguin population. In the endless ocean, land is a precious resource, and seabirds flock here to breed. Atlantic yellow-nosed albatrosses range far and wide over the open ocean. but this is the place that they nest. High above the settlement is a plateau that looks like something from a lost world. It's covered in a unique forest of dwarf tree ferns. And it's here that the albatrosses come to breed. Most pairs remain together for many years. Their bond reinforced by bill fencing and tail fanning displays. Many return to the exact same nest site year after year to rear their enormous single chick. Both parents feed the ever-hungry baby 
on a nutritious mix of regurgitated fish and squid. When the chick fledges, it won't return to these rugged islands until it's time to find a mate. <laughs> As our journey continues south from Tristan, we reach a tongue of land that's a continuation of the South American Andes, the Antarctic Peninsula. Even on this frozen continent, there is a little bit of Britain. Port Lockroy, a British base established by the military during World War II, and now a piece of history. Surrounded by Gen 2 penguins, there's even a post office here. Britain claims a wedge of the continent, including this peninsula, but all national territorial claims have been suspended under the Treaty of Antarctica. Moving south, new species make their appearance in these frigid waters, chinstrap penguins and crab-eater seals. is a scenic wonderland with jagged mountain peaks, icebergs and glaciers. Most of Antarctica is buried in ice, but here along the peninsula, rocks are exposed, home for its sparse flora of lichens and mosses. The peninsula was once joined to South America, but some 40 million years ago, a gap opened up between the two continents, the Drake Passage. It completely altered the ocean's currents. Water now circulated freely all around Antarctica, cutting the continent off from the warming influence of currents from the north. Antarctica froze over, but the new patterns also created waters of incredible abundance. Creatures like humpback whales make long annual migrations from tropical calving grounds to feed in these rich waters. When Antarctica and South America parted company, the crust between them stretched and fractured. This movement created a new island, South Georgia. Here, glaciers sweep down to the sea, and flocks of Antarctic terns gather to feed in the rich waters just offshore. The island is one of the world's greatest spectacles. Gentoo penguins and Antarctic fur seals crowd its beaches. South Georgia hosts one of the world's biggest colonies of Gentoo penguins. but they have to share this island with giant petrels, the vultures of the southern ocean. They feast on any carcass they find, 
but are capable of killing an old or injured Gentoo. swept hillsides, wandering albatrosses nest. These birds have the longest wingspan of any living bird and spend their lives circumnavigating the globe, except when they come here to breed. But the most spectacular colonies here belong to king penguins. South Georgia holds some of the biggest king penguin colonies on the planet. Nearly a million birds in total. And unlike many island birds, their population has recently been going up. The newly hatched chicks are insulated from the cold by balancing on their parents' feet. But once they are bigger, they have a luxurious coat of downy feathers that protects them from the chill sub-Antarctic wind. South Georgia is home to huge elephant seals. weighing in at up to 9,000 pounds and over 16 feet in length. These are formidable animals. They've also come here to breed, the males defending a group of much smaller females. Only the biggest males, the beach masters, will get a chance to breed. And they use their huge bulk to fight off rivals. they are successful, they'll get to mate with all the females in their group. In their hulking shadows are smaller cousins, Antarctic fur seals. A different species from those living on Tristan, they prefer the cooler waters here. But like their more northerly relatives, they too were reduced to the brink of extinction by hunting. Once, there were millions of fur seals here. But by the early 20th century, they had all but vanished. Thankfully, those days are over. Today, fur seals are protected, and their numbers are on the rise. And now they play and rest among the relics of the old sealing stations, a testament to the resilience of nature. But some creatures weren't so lucky. At the start of the 20th century, the waters around South Georgia were teeming with whales. But whalers weren't far behind. This uninhabited British outpost very quickly became the center of the globe's whaling industry. In just over 50 years, more than 48,000 whales were processed here. Mounds of harpoon heads still litter the ground. Until the 1960s, the whales were killed for their oil. Most of it to make margarine and soap. When the enormous bodies were hauled ashore into the processing plants, an army of men got to work, stripped the blubber from the carcasses like peeling a banana. shoveled the meat 
into giant cookers. The whaling stations were finally abandoned around 50 years ago, but that great slaughter still echoes in this forgotten world. Huge cookers and whale oil tanks creak and groan with the wind. had all but been destroyed. Now, offered some protection, a few species are starting to recover. But the hole cut in the ocean's ecosystem by the whalers may never be repaired. South Georgia was formed and lifted above the ocean waves when two tectonic plates collided. But just over 900 miles away are another set of islands with a different origin. The Falkland Islands sit on the Patagonian continental shelf, making them part of the South American continent. The land between them separated long ago, leaving deep water. On the last part of our journey, we are greeted by large pods of Commerson's dolphins. The Falklands archipelago consists of two main islands and over 700 small ones. Far from the bleak place that is often imagined, these islands can be beautiful. Deserted coves and beaches looking more like the tropical Caribbean than the subantarctic. The Falklands are also claimed by Argentina, which resulted in the Falklands War in 1982. Stark reminders of that time still dot the islands. The remains of a helicopter. and memorials to the British and Argentine soldiers and Falkland Islanders who died in the conflict. But there's another legacy from the war, one that's still lethal. Mines left in the ground after the Falklands War. They're a reminder of that bloody struggle. Some 3,000 people live here, many of them in the capital Stanley on East Falkland. It has a distinctly British flavor, complete with pubs serving fish and chips. The Falklands are much larger than any of the oceanic islands, and the rich Antarctic waters are a magnet for wildlife. Southern rockhopper penguins and black-browed albatrosses. And hanging around the edges of these seabird colonies is the world's most southerly bird of prey, the striated caracara. These birds have a fearsome intelligence and are drawn to anything new, especially if it's shiny.
A dropped coin demands instant attention. And to scramble to gain possession of this precious item. They feed mainly by scavenging. But they also grab any eggs or young that are left unattended. And there are plenty of opportunities here. 70% of all the black-browed albatrosses on the planet come to the Falklands to rear their chicks. That's more than the human population of Manhattan. Ocean wanderers think nothing of flying hundreds of miles to find food for their chicks. The Falklands have been inhabited for hundreds of years, and on the main islands, livestock has grazed out much of the native vegetation. But small islands, just a few hundred yards offshore, are still pristine. Some are covered in huge tussocks of grass, which shelter the nest burrows of vast colonies of seabirds. sooty sheer waters, returning to the island at sunset, almost 15,000 pairs nest on this one tiny island alone. Once, sailors reported the Falkland Island sky was black with seabirds. Islands scattered along the length of the Atlantic are all special places. Evolution has produced unique species and new behaviors. And these tiny specks of land draw creatures that travel the whole globe. They are both crucibles of evolution and precious breeding sites for marine mammals and birds. They truly are arcs cast adrift in the Atlantic.